Welcome to the Open Ocean Summer Seminar Series. I'm Dr. Katie Croft Bell, Director of the Open Ocean Initiative at the MIT Media Lab. And in case you've missed previous seminars, we have posted um, all of the recorded spring and summer ones online. I'm putting the link in the chat and as well as the complete summer seminar lineup through the end of August. So we do have two more uh, through the end of August. And now I'm very happy to introduce um, this. This particular seminar has a co-host, um, Dr. David Newman, Professor David Newman, uh, Professor of Aeronautical and Astronautical Engineering at MIT and Director of the Human Systems Lab. So Dar uh, Deva is in Montana right now, so hopefully her bandwidth is good enough to um, introduce today's amazing speaker, Darlene Lim. Hi, everyone. Katie, how's that? Can you hear me? Yeah, loud and clear. Excellent. It's wonderful to see you all. I'm super excited for this seminar. Uh, shout out from, uh, yeah, exploring the Montana mountains. And uh, so it's my great pleasure to introduce a really dear friend. Dr. Darlene Lim is uh, an explorer herself. She, uh, we're going to hear an amazing talk by her. She's at the NASA Ames Research Center. And um, she's done so many analog missions. Uh, she's a geobiologist by training. Uh, she knows more than anyone I know about uh, analog missions and operations. And what I love about Darlene being a biologist is that she crosses over and works so well with all of us engineers in terms of integrating all the technology and operations into unbelievably exciting missions to uh, get us uh, to the moon and Mars and to really um, kind of help answer that fundamental question, you know, what about life? What about life on other planets and when will we find it? Where will we find it? It's kind of her expertise. She's a principal investigator on a number of uh, ongoing missions for NASA. Subsea, I think we'll probably hear a little bit about. I had the great pleasure to work with her on what we called um, basalt. And um, we're currently working together on something called resource. So I don't want to steal all the, and uh, previously finesse, I don't want to steal any of her thunder. She's uh, been over 20 years at, at NASA Ames, and she hails from the great nation of Canada. And we're just lucky to have her uh, down in the, the Bay Area with us. So uh, I think I'll, I'll leave it like that. And I can't wait to hear your talk, Darlene. So good to see you all. And thanks everyone for joining. Thanks, Katie, and the Open Oceans Initiative as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was so lovely. It's such a nice way. It's early here. Well, early ish on the West Coast. And uh, it's a great way to start the day. So thank you. Um, just wanted to also specifically thank Open Ocean and all of you for spending the next hour with us uh, today together um, to talk about Earth space and then take it back to the oceans. Um, and uh, I just really want to also thank Jenny and Katie for all the organization that's gone into this. Really appreciate it. So um, I'm going to just start slow sharing my slides and we'll get into the talk here um, go for it okay you guys can see the presentation view looks great okay fantastic so as david summarized i've had the joy of working side by side with folks like deva with katie with many others, hundreds of people over the years on various analog research projects. And this has taken me, you know, very fortunately all over the world um, to different polar regions, to lakes, to the um, to deserts, volcanoes, and most recently to the deep ocean uh, with the project called Subsea. And in all of these cases, I've been sort of focused on um, using these settings really as a learning opportunity, as a springboard for understanding how best to enable science and exploration to flourish during human and robotic exploration of the moon and Mars. And the original talk title implies that I would spend the time today kind of moving through the portfolio of activities and research output that we've been uh, putting forward over the last couple of decades. But I thought that I would sort of take one step further and actually bring these learnings full circle back to the oceanographic, the earth sciences and the environmental sciences communities that I think you know, are probably in the audience today. Um, and I was thinking about this because my son and I were having a really great conversation about climate change and the effects that climate change will have, the acute effects on, um, you know, the human population. And um, he was, you know, we were sort of working through this conversation and I realized that I wanted to try and bring some of that today to this conversation that we'll have um, regarding all of these different learnings that we've managed to gather up 
from earth scientists, from the way that they work, and then transitioning that to try and design and develop mission elements for you know, future human robotic scientific exploration. But then consider what we've learned in the realm of what will be coming down the pipeline for oceanographers, for earth scientists in general, as the earth grows, goes through this very dynamic period of change, and as we will absolutely um, see humans have to adjust in likely not only just a, a long-term basis, but probably very tactical, you know, um, uh, moment to moment uh, periods of time where ideally decision making will include, you know, the academic population, the research population that has spent so many years thinking about how to manage, through, how to care for our oceans, and also potentially how to mitigate through these types of effects on, on humans and broadly our, our, our environment. So that's what I'm going to be doing today. And and um, just to show some images of what we've been doing to summarize some of the work uh, of these analog missions over the past couple of decades. Analogs are basically places on Earth that um, approximate some sort of physical or operational condition that we're trying to simulate from, you know, on another, um, in another planetary system. So for example, if we're trying to simulate conducting missions on Mars, will actually go to a part of the Earth that is uh, that will offer some sort of similarity, whether it's the volcanic um, environment of, say, uh, Hawaii or potentially Idaho, um, and then we'll actually simulate the conditions of what we might uh, anticipate having to work through when we when we have these um, when we have humans walking around on the surface of Mars. So, in the top left here you see um, a group of scientists as well as in the center, and this is my image, is a shout out to many of my amazing colleagues at MIT uh, working here, I believe this is in Hawaii, actually on um, a 3D visualization tool set that I'll touch on briefly as we go through this talk. But you know, scientists in the field tend to work together. Um, they work independently, they work through problems as they come up. Um, they may also do this when they work in more extreme environments uh, where, you know, their lives are indeed being constrained by the operational conditions of working underwater. These are some images from a lake in Canada called Pavilion Lake, where we actually put a deep worker submersible, a single person submersible in the lake, and enabled scientists to get trained up on operating these subs so that they could themselves interrogate the lake firsthand. Um, despite the fact that the lake was very deep and very long, they could stay, they could stay submerged for up to six plus hours. Um, equally, we had divers exploring the lake, but in all of these cases, they were, the scientists were able to be there and to interact with their environment and understand it firsthand. And as I said, very importantly, work through the problems that they encountered um, moment to moment on their own while they were you know, immersed in this environment. Now we know that with this new paradigm of work coming online where we have astronauts returning to the moon, heading onwards to Mars, that we're going to have to shift the way that we work as scientists because we're going to have to, in some ways, enable these individuals to represent our broader science goals when they go about exploring these planetary systems on our behalf, on humanity's behalf. We'll also have to spend time thinking about the operational concepts, the capabilities, the technologies that will be required, such as these 3D visualization tools, to support this type of this type of interaction between the scientists that will remain largely on Earth, and then the very small subset of representatives that will head off to the Moon, to Mars, and and, and elsewhere. So, how do we enable the science and exploration to flourish through this new work paradigm? Well, what we've been doing is trying to learn and distill out what are some of the essentials that scientists here need on Earth so that we can build the right systems to support science as we move into these more challenging operational conditions. But as I mentioned, I didn't want to, I didn't want to stop there for this talk. I wanted to come full circle and consider some of the threads, the commonalities that we've been able to identify through this work, and then think about them within the context of ocean exploration. I also want to talk to you about um, the different projects that we've, that we've um, you know, really used to identify these common threads. And that fundamentally, when um, I look across all the projects that I've been involved with, there are different types of science objectives that have come you know, really uh, to, the, to, to be the priorities. But despite these changing you know, goals and objectives, there have been some really um, sort of, uh, I guess, um, tech object or agnostic or operationally agnostic um, threads that have bubbled up to the surface. And so these common threads that enable science and exploration in operationally challenging conditions 
Well, fundamentally, they require timely and scientifically meaningful data acquisition, synthesis, dissemination, and visualization. They need um, you know, to create really an intellectual space or a breathing room, time for scientists to collectively contemplate these data. And we need to create stable communication architectures that support scientific exploration. So not just telemetry coming back, not just health and status, but we need to have a communication system, a ground data system as an example, that enables scientists to absorb the data that they need in a timely fashion, think about it, so again, that breathing room, and then put out some timely decisioning back into the community so that broadly we can make decisions, whether that's through human exploration, joint human robotic exploration, um, and whether that's here on Earth or in space um, or in our deep oceans. So fundamentally, as the last point says, we need to kind of operationalize scientific exploration, understand the nitty gritty, the movement, the processes, put that, take it apart, put it back together to enable true interdisciplinary research. And my hope in bringing this, these, these threads back to you all, and, and I'm going to take you through um, some of the development efforts in a, in a few more slides, is that in the future, my hope is that the subject matter experts that um, are in the realm of oceanography, of earth science, environmental science, will be tapped into, will be brought into the conversation of how to manage and mitigate um, the acute effects of climate change on our Earth's oceans and on millions of, of human beings, but that will, that your populations will be, you know, your communities will be brought in, not just in a sort of committee, you know, realm or to write papers and, and think about things on those timescales, but rather on more urgent timescales um, so that, you know, your expertise will always be in the room. And I think there are ways to do that effectively through some of the processes that we've been identifying. So um, I wanted to just take you through, indeed, some of the portfolio of, uh, or the portfolio of, of activities that have um, been underway over the last couple of decades and show you that despite the fact that the science objectives is, have changed, the environments have changed, that we still managed to tease out very common themes when it comes to what's required to support work under more operationally constrained conditions, um, and that work specifically being science. So, you know, as scientists, we do like to take our time, as I, as I alluded to earlier on um, in, a couple of slides ago, we like to talk, we like to really methodically dig into things. But I've found that even if you squeeze on that, if you actually put constraints, which are potentially a little bit unnatural for the scientists, but which are akin to what we can expect to, to have on our plates as we move into more and more complicated uh, space exploration missions, that science can still flourish. So in this lake in, um, in Canada, Pavilion Lake, we actually conducted, as I mentioned, underwater uh, surveys and science um, and experiments, in situ experiments, on these structures called microbialites, which are rocks, uh, rock structures, carbonate structures built by microbes. Um, this lake was very deep and long, um, and we started this project out fundamentally looking at natural science problems, but realized that the way that we were conducting science actually had value to the spaceflight community. Um, and so we brought in um, a, a, a group of, of folks that were um, from the Johnson Space Center that were operations specialists looking at EVA dynamics, extravehicular activity dynamics. And we started to collaborate with them as well as other people that were looking at communication architectures for, for um, remote and more operationally challenging environments. And what we did is we took the science and we kind of created a simulated environment that um, was akin to actually operating in this case um, on, on a, a near earth object or an asteroid. And so while our scientists were underwater and actually conducting science, we transmitted their voice, their, their location, their video, their imaging back to um, a mission support center that was sitting on shore, but, you know, quite far away. But we did that transmission under a voice and video delay of about 50 seconds one way. So this really simulated the conditions of how the, the latency that would be involved with transmitting information from an asteroid back to Earth. And we did this in order to understand how the entire science system would sort of react to this new environmental condition of having to make decisions, having to, to think about data as it came back, even though it was slightly delayed. So it was a very messy experiment. And this was one of the first um, in situ experiments that was conducted in the NASA analog portfolio, portfolio of conducting real science, not simulated science, but science that actually had to be put through the paces, published in, you know, uh, in peer-reviewed publications, 
Um, but we did it all with this uh, added difficulty of, this, of the communication delay. And um, the result was that we started to pull out interesting work threads that we actually had to really define the process of making decisions carefully. We had to timeline the, the decision making very carefully so that we didn't start to step on each other and actually over anticipate what somebody might be asking from the depths of Pavilion Lake or under anticipate their needs as well. So that meant that actually we had to do a lot of work in the pre-mission um, time frame in order to get ourselves ready for these very challenging conditions. And yet many papers have come out from this from these um, different simulated experiments in the realm of the natural sciences and been published in peer reviewed publications. We have lots of graduate students that move through their thesis as well. So that was really the forcing fun function and the check to figure out whether or not we were doing our jobs. But from here, we moved on to other analog research projects um, where we utilize some of the capabilities and the operational concepts that we learned from Pavilion Lake and then applied them to again, a very different science environment than Pavilion Lake. In this case, um, this is a project called the Mojave Volatiles Prospector uh, Program, and it was run by a dear friend of uh, Deva and mine, uh, Jen Heldman, who's at uh, the NASA Ames Research Center. And in this case, the science goal was to understand um, water emplacement and retention and distribution in the Mojave Desert as a lunar analog, so an, as an analog to um, understanding water um, on, on the lunar regolith. And so in this case, this was completely a robotic exploration mission. But again, we, we took the robot and then we put it out in the Mojave, but we kept um, all of the scientists back at NASA Ames and we put them in different roles. And they had to then, you know, synthesize and interact, synthesize the data and interact with those data and then put back into the community of, of decision makers um, specific thoughts uh, about where we should rove, about why we should rove, justify those decisions scientifically. And to do so, we drew from Pavilion Lake and some of the operational concepts in terms of how we actually aligned people for conversations, the timelining, as well as the um, way that we uh, designed the softwares and the, the software that we implemented in order to synthesize and interact with those data. So again, the, some of the software and the capabilities we were working on and these processes got evolved through this brand new analog here with very different scientific goals. And recently, as, as Eva um, introduced at, in the beginning of this talk, we've been working on a project called Basalt. And Basalt is actually, again, um, it takes us back on land. In this case, we've been working in the um, Kilauea region of Hawaii, as well as in Idaho at Craters of the Moon National Monument and Preserve. And in this circumstance, the science has been focused on investigating the habitability, habitability gradients of Mars analog volcanic environments. And just to cut to the, to the punchline, many peer reviewed publications have come out of this in terms of the natural science as well. And what's remarkable to me is that these papers have come out despite the fact that we took field scientists, earth scientists of a variety of different disciplines and put them together and then told them you can't go out and do your science. We're only going to allow six individuals to do your science for you. And we told this to senior scientists, to graduate students, to postdoctoral researchers. And we said, we're gonna do the entire um, next four years under simulated Mars mission conditions. And so this was you know, a difficult thing to swallow as it always has been through all of these different analog projects, but we got it done nevertheless. And we did so because again, we had to tease out what they needed, we, need, we needed the scientists to articulate their requirements, their specifications, and then translate that into capabilities, into technology capabilities, hardware, software, as well as different operational processes that enabled us to do, get this work done. Subsea, similar circumstance here, except this time in the deep ocean. Um, in the Pacific Ocean, we actually worked on different hydrothermal systems most recently with um, the, uh, in partnership with NOAA and the Ocean Exploration Trust. So in this circumstance, again, very different um, scientific goals. And yet again, as I'll show you, some very common themes and, um, that have come to fruition. So in this circumstance, the natural sciences um, team for subsea was actually focused on characterizing novel deep sea environments um, and to then use that as a springboard for understanding the potential habitability of other ocean worlds. There's a social science research team as well that was trying to really characterize the telepresence mission architecture that we use, that I'll show you in a, in a couple slides, um, for science and exploration on this project. 
and to understand its utility as, again, a springboard for understanding how we might explore um, on Mars, as an example, using low latency um, telerobotics, where we actually have, for example, a crew of two orbiting the surface, or orbiting Mars while they're conducting robotic exploration on the surface um, in what's called a low latency or a low communication um, delay environment. So a very specific goal for the social scientists. And then we actually had technology team that was deeply embedded with us evolving some of the tools and capabilities that had started way back in Pavilion Lake, but which had evolved and continued to change and develop to support science under these very difficult operational con uh, conditions. And they were here with us during subsea to try and take it one step further and understand the needs of ocean scientists. Uh, again, for the purpose of supporting ocean science, but also for supporting future work paradigms of, of um, included in, uh, in, in the, the world that we imagine for space exploration. So I'm gonna stop a bit here um, and dwell on subsea uh, because I know that you know, this is of interest certainly to this audience. Well, subsea is an analog research project, again, that was funded uh, by NASA and there was also support from NOAA and um, the Ocean Exploration Trust. And we conducted our research on the Nautilus ship um, and uh, we actually visited two different hydrothermal um, sites in the Pacific Ocean. And um, the thing that we did though, is of course not bring all, we didn't bring all of the scientists on the ship with us. It just was an impossibility. So the bulk of them actually remained on shore and were tied into the mission from the University of Rhode Island at the Inner Space Center there. So that was our mission control. And we used this, what's called the telepresence opportunity in order to engage those scientists. And again, to learn about what they needed in order to feel that they were really part of the mission to help and enable the science that was happening on the ship and in the deep ocean, even though we were running operations 24 seven on the ship. And we were trying to characterize this particular work environment here, the telepresence work environment in the ocean as an analog to um, the, you know, these, these future architectures where we have low latency tele, um, telerobotics happening on places such as Mars and a joint human robotic presence on these um, other planetary systems. So what we did is that we actually had two different cruises for subsea. Um, both were 14 day um, plus, you know, a little bit of wiggle room on either end expeditions. And the first year, what, the, um, what we did is we actually went to sea in the Luihi Seamount and we actually had some people sit, um, some of our graduate students were still at ISU, Idaho State University and some at um, Arizona State University. But then we had, you know, other people sitting on the East Coast as well um, at their institutions. And then we had actually a subset of the scientists cruise with us on board of the Nautilus out at Luihi. And we tried to understand how all of these different components would actually have to work together in order to provide the, the you know, the intellectual space and the support for science to take hold um, on the ship. So um, this was really a year where the social scientists and the operational scientists studied business as usual, if you will. So telepresence as it stood in this particular paradigm of, of ocean exploration. And then in the second year, we actually went, did a, a second cruise that offered the scientists, the natural scientists, the opportunity to really expand some of their thinking from what they learned in the first year to a different hydrothermal system um, in the Gorder Ridge region, which is just off the coast of the Oregon, California border. But in this case, the social scientists conducted an experiment where they really squeezed the operational um, environment of telepresence into two different modalities. One in which there were limited communication channels and timing of exchanges between the, the scientists that were all now co-located at the University of Rhode Island and those people that were on the ship. So that was very different than what happened the first year when there was really um, an open communication all the time through text, through you know, um, uh, just uh, uh, various communication channels that we had on the ship. Um, and there was constant exchange of information in the first year and that really got squeezed down through some of the experiments that were conducted in the second year. And we did so to try and see how science might react to this different operational modality, which is more akin to what we expect when we have crews um, in deep space operating in circumstances where they cannot communicate with those scientists on Earth all the time. And then within this cruise, we also had a period where we returned to more, what was called more normative, condi normative conditions or business as usual as it compared to the first year. So 
throughout this, um, this experiment, there was science that was being conducted. And I'm just gonna very rapidly run through some of the projects that were ongoing that were still enabled despite the operational conditions that we put them through. So was, there was geochemical modeling that was being led through um, the University of the, uh, Arizona State University. And in this circumstance here, um, there were conceptual models of what the hydrothermal systems we were investigating were actually, um, or the energetics of these, uh, of these hydrothermal systems. And what the, um, the goal of this particular team was, was to understand whether or not they could predict some of the energetics of the system prior to actually visiting the site, and then use what we were, we were seeing in real time coming back from the ship in order to tweak this model and then make predictions farther afield as to whether or not, um, whether or not we would find similar environments. So this work was underway. There was also um, a geology team that was actually looking at the physical geology of um, the hydrothermal systems that we were interrogating, trying to understand and characterize um, these systems as they pertain to the modeling, as well as to fundamentally the life that we were also um, exploring and uh, um, trying to characterize along these different um, hydrothermal systems. So this work here is being led by um, Amy Smith, who's at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute and, and Julie Huber. And they were actually um, conducting experiments as well as gathering samples from the different hydrothermal systems and trying to understand um, what, you know, the biomass, trying to understand and characterize the, um, the microbial populations that were living um, in association with these different, different hydrothermal systems. And then taking that as, again, a springboard to understand um, the habitability potential of other ocean systems in our, in our solar system. So all of this work was underway, um, very different, uh, you know, fundamentally hydrothermal systems that we were exploring, but again, in service of these natural science um, experiments. And results have been coming in as I'm cycling through right now and papers are being published, despite the fact that we squeezed them down into these different modalities of operating, which were very unnatural, um, and unprecedented in many ways for um, oceanographers to move through. And so this has been a, a long kind of walkthrough, but I did wanna share with you all that what I'm gonna put forward in, in, in terms of one of the many capabilities that we've been designing to enable this type of science to flourish despite the, the constraints of, of working, whether in these types of modalities and in the open ocean, um, these simulated modalities or you know, in the future in space, is that um, it, to, it doesn't really matter what the science is that's at hand. There are very common threads that we found um, have been articulated by the scientists, whether working on land or underwater, and whether you know, studying the systems from a, biologic, a, bio, a biological, a geological, or you know, perhaps even a um, you know, name your field here um, perspective. So one of the uh, first points that I put up is that the scientists really require timely and scientifically meaningful data acquisition, synthesis, dissemination, and visualization tools. And so one of the tools that has um, been evolved over time is called XGDS. And this is a tool that's been developed at NASA Ames in collaboration with scientists since, the, since before Pavilion Lake, but really it sort of flourished and started to take hold during the Pavilion Lake um, analog period. And it's evolved through Mahat, the, the MVP um, experiment. It's evolved through Basalt, Subsea, and many other um, analog programs such as uh, Desert Rats and Nemo. This is an open source uh, web uh, website application, and it, and basically it's a science-focused tool for data synthesis for multi-user real-time collaboration and decision making. Making and as far as we can tell from the various quantitative and qualitative um, surveys that it, that this team has done you know, science teams love it. And that's predominantly because it's built to support science under tactically demanding conditions. And as I mentioned, it's supported a, a wide array of platforms. And what's not included in the slide is that it's supported a wide array of scientific objectives. And the tech goals of the XGDS software is to create this, you know, um, support mechanism for the rapid search for, um, for data, for the interaction of data and the annotation of data in real time, as well as in an archived um, environment or an archive period of when you might be interacting with these, with these data sets. And um, what they've created is an opportunity for scientists to, for example, author map layers and then interactively in a collaborative manner um, actually work on these map layers and come to decisions in timely manners as a collective 
uh, you know, despite the fact that they may or may not be co-located in any particular space and maybe may be working in very strange um, uh, uh, time frames that require them under a pressure cooker kind of environment to make very specific decisions. So um, the other thing that I wanted to show you here is that it's because it's web-based, it's collaborative. And we found that this is um, very important that we don't want uh, to have to encumber scientists who already have so many standalone um, software systems to have to download one more thing. We want them to be able to log into a system that they can immediately um, interact with and collaborate with no matter what time zone they're in, no matter what their, their um, you know, pressing decision is on their plate that they have to, to, to actually um, to make. And so these types of, um, of tool sets have not just been developed by engineers uh, you know, in a room, not actually collaborating and interacting with scientists. All of this type of, of capabilities have actually come as a, as a deep collaboration between the engineers who have been developing XGDS and a bevy of scientists, as I've demonstrated um, across a, a variety of different um, disciplines. The other thing that this tool can do is um, that it can actively stream uh, data coming back from the field so that the scientists really have a good sense of what's going on so that it can build situational awareness um, within our science teams. So in this case, you're seeing some video from um, some of the hydrothermal exploration that we did with subsea. And you see that the scientists sitting at the University of Rhode Island were not working in the dark per se. They were actually enabled to see what we were seeing on the ship. There were various strip charts that were being uh, produced in front of them, synthesized, so that again, we sort of took as much of the guesswork for them out of the way so that they could really feel that they were there on the ship and understanding what was going on. Despite the fact that they could not communicate with us in real time during that first experimental modality, and despite the fact that they were not there. So again, you remember from this, I think the second or third slide that I showed you, typically scientists in the field like to be co-located making decisions together. But once you strip that opportunity away, you've got to put tools like this in front of them um, and these are the types of learnings that we've, we've come forward with in order to enable them to still actively and effectively interact and help with the science productivity um, on the ship or in, in the future, you know, on other planetary systems. And this is um, another example of a capability within this tool set here that we uh, were told by scientists we actually really need to integrate. And that is the, the replay of data, the synchronized replay of data if you miss something, if you, if you leave the room, but you wanna come back into mission control and participate in the science discourse that's underway, you've gotta be able to rewind and on demand see what just happened. That gives you more, again, situational awareness and a better understanding of what everybody is talking about. And this type of um, kind of understanding of how people actually work, the fact that they can't be at their console all the time, but that for them to come back and be you know, a contributing part, an active part of scientific discourse, they need to have these types of tool sets put in front of them. So again, this is a demonstration that I'm showing you from Subsea, but these types of requirements have evolved over time from analog to analog to analog throughout all of these different science objectives. And this team right now is working um, to improve the XGDS system um, as it pertains to Subsea and providing more ar archival capabilities better 3D visualization capabilities, and also to support in the future, we hope, more distributed teams, because we're all working in this new paradigm right now of having to work in a distributed manner and yet still do our jobs. So they're really trying to support this um, uh, you know, new environment that we've all been forced into, which is very different for many scientists. So let me just switch gears and take us back on land and show you that, and tell you as well that XGDS was used um, to support basalt because again, the scientists working in this simulated Mars mission condition that I'll show you in a second, again, had very similar requirements and specifications for being able to see what was going on out in the field, in the field where they couldn't be, but you know, where they had to be intellectually in order to ensure that their work was getting done. Um, and the other thing that came to to pass you know, throughout the PASALT program was that we really needed to create the space for the scientists to enable themselves to have the discourse, despite the fact that, that we put them through the paces of having to make decisions in a very um, timely manner, in a very a challenging operational environment that sim simulated what we expect to be the case uh, when we're running EBAs on Mars. So this particular program, as I mentioned, was focused on habitability, um, 
and uh, in volcanic settings that were acting as analogs to Mars. And there is a special issue that was put out in March of 2019 that includes a number of papers that cover um, the natural sciences, the operational research, the tech research that we conducted. Um, and we, um, just to refresh your memories, in this particular project operated um, in the Kilauea region as well as in the Craters of the Moon um, region of Idaho. So two different settings, again, meant to simulate as an analog um, different you know, uh, geological conditions on Mars. The terrain in these areas as well was, um, was interesting and challenging for not just the scientists to move through and to interrogate, but also for those that were designing communication systems that were essential to enabling us to do our jobs um, in this uh, simulated mission environment. So what we did is we spent months on time <clears throat> working with the scientists to understand what type of geology, biology, organic geochemistry, and so forth um, was going to be of, of priority to this particular project, how they were intending on actually conducting their research, and then telling them they couldn't do it firsthand. So they'd have to really articulate their specifications for those of us that were building the, uh, the processes in order to carry this out for them on their behalf. And then when we went into the field, um, we actually separated. So we had the team of people that were out in, say, the Kilauea region conducting the field science, um, relying on all these capabilities that we'd spent months on time developing in deep collaboration with the scientists. And then we actually situated a group of sub subject matter experts. So the graduate students, the postdoc, the senior scientists, anywhere from 15 to, tw to 20 kilometers away in a mission support center where they could see what was going on in the field and they could interact with the data that was coming in through, again, this XGDS system, um, but they could not actively participate in the field with the collection of samples with the in situ experiments that were going on. And then the other sort of um, additional headache that we introduced into their lives is something called time delay or that latency that I talked about uh, that we started uh, working with during the Pavilion Lake era. And so in this particular circumstance, the scientists that were sitting in this mission support center were on Earth in this simulated environment, and they interacted with those out in the field that were on Mars um, through this communication network that introduced anywhere from a five to a 15 minute one way communication delay between these, these two parties here. And that's meant to simulate the, um, the delays that we will have when we send signals between the Earth and Mars. It's going to be um, a dynamic uh, latency, so it'll change depending on the orbital parameters of the, of the Earth and Mars. But fundamentally, we will never be able to interact real time with anybody on the surface, surface of Mars or any robotic asset on the surface of Mars from Earth. So in that particular circumstance, what we were interested in understanding is, while a science EVA was progressing, a science-driven extravehicular activity was progressing, could people on Earth, scientists on Earth, still provide some sort of meaningful feedback to the astronauts on Mars that would help them to, to optimize the science return? The prevailing hypothesis was no. You actually would just have to kind of wind up the system and let it loose. But we really wanted to test that. And uh, the net result of all this work is that, in fact, if you have the right processes, the right um, architectural design, the right communication system, and indeed the right capabilities supporting science, supporting those that are in the field doing science, you can actually have meaningful back and forth conversations that optimize the science, despite the fact that you have these in incredibly long communication delays between the Earth and Mars. So um, we, uh, again, introduced XGDS and developed and evolved it through the, the basalt project, because again, thematically, very similar um, requirements coming from the scientists as we saw in previous analogs. We also had um, a timeline management tool that again has its roots at MIT. Um, and this timeline management tool uh, enabled the scientists as well as those that were in the field and managing um, the work that was happening in the field and understanding of when they had to the decision um, and the amount of time that they had to kind of think and create space for themselves to understand the problem and the fact that they didn't have, you know, as long as they wanted, they could not operate on time scales that we, they were used to necessarily um, if they were just conducting business as usual in the field or in their labs. We also had um, another contribution from MIT called Sextant, which is the di a dynamic path planning tool that helped us to understand where it is that we could optimize our path when, this, when the astronauts were actually interrogating the environment. Um, and so this 
all of these three capabilities were actually brought into our lives to try and enable this discourse between the scientists on Earth and those that were operating um, in the simulated Mars condition. So I'll just show you this video and let me check the time here. Um, what we were doing as well operationally is really trying to create intellectual breathing uh, room and time for scientists to contemplate the data coming in uh, from the field and to make decisions that could affect what was going on in, uh, on Mars. So you see here the astronauts walking through and actually dropping markers in areas that they thought were of importance to the science objectives that the scientists had on Earth. And as they did so, that information started to get started to be transmitted back to Earth in a, um, but under these time delays. And as we received them on Earth, the scientists started to have these collective discourses, interact with XGDS, make decisions as a whole, and, start, and they started to prioritize the markers as they saw the markers meeting their scientific, scientific objectives. And as they um, came to a decision at a specific time, they transmitted that back to, to, to the simulated Mars environment. And then these two astronauts knew how to down select their sample um, collection from there and which samples were of greater and greater importance to the science team because the, the science team on Earth, they were told could, they could only get one sample. One sample site actually sampled and then the rocks brought back to Earth. They couldn't have all the samples from all of those markers. So what we were trying to figure out here is how to enable that conversation to happen um, where the, the subject matter experts on Earth enabled these astronauts here to make a more and more informed decision. That was very difficult under the latency conditions that we imposed on this operational ex experiment, as well as very difficult given the complexity of the science that was going on. And yet that was enabled um, through the implementation of these different um, data uh, uh, software systems, as well as through the operational timelining and so forth that we put in place. I also just wanted to show you quickly um, some of these, another tool, a 3D visualization tool that again, uh, finds its roots at MIT. Um, this is a, a resource path planning tool that was visualized um, through an augmented uh, reality um, experiment that we conducted so that we could examine whether or not these types of visualization tools would again enable the astronauts as well as the scientists to make more and more informed decisions despite the fact that the operational conditions were very difficult. Let me move onwards here. Now, one of the um, interesting things that has happened as of late is that the learning that we've garnered throughout all of these different analogs that, and the threads that we've been pulling out are now getting applied to a robotic mission that will take flight um, in uh, November of 2023. And that is um, the Viper mission of the Volatiles Investigating Polar Exploration Rover mission. This particular mission is really interesting um, operationally because we're headed to the south polar region of the moon. There is not a long latency. There's about uh, 1.3 second to potentially, you know, a, a slightly longer, but still a second latency between our communications from the earth to the moon. So this is very different than say operating on Mars, where again, you will have minutes um, to, you know, longer to actually make a decision, hours in many cases. In our particular operating sense that um, for this mission here, will actually be operating in a much faster clip. And so there really is no um, analog or precedence for this in the robotic exploration um, mission portfolio up to now. And in fact, the closest analog in terms of how to engage scientists to help make decisions um, in this uh, planetary environment is probably looking back to the Apollo missions when we had a science backroom team engage with the astronauts on the surface of the moon in a, in a almost real time um, kind of capacity, a very con controlled capacity um, nevertheless. So what we've been doing is actually many of us that have worked on these analog missions over time and that have these types of threads that have really you know, um, come, to our, our, um, come to bear as we've moved through these different projects, we're actually now involved with the Viper mission and we're taking all that learning and applying it to this very tactically demanding um, uh, experiment or mission that will be exploring the polar regions of the moon. And so I find that very interesting in that, again, an extremely different circumstance here um, with a robotic mission in this case, and also um, a different environment and different um, science objectives in this case, characterizing um, the water weight percent and the lunar regolith in this, um, you know, very uh, challenging environment. So 
I bring this up simply to demonstrate that like there has been an evolution of learning and a continuum of learning that has come to bear throughout all of these different projects, no matter where we are. And one of the other elements that is important that I wanted to share with you today is this, the third point that I put up early on in this talk regarding creating communication networks that are supportive of science. Um, we have found that, for example, through these different missions here, these, these robotic missions or through other analog missions, that communication systems tend to really prioritize the health and safety of the assets that are, they're out exploring, whether that's robotic elements in, in the case of Viper, or in the future, you know, and, and currently human assets that are exploring our, um, our, our you know, inner solar system here. And so um, in the future, we know that we'd like to involve scientists, of course, and in actively participating in these conversations as the EVAs and as the Viper rover interrogates the moon. And so we want to make sure that the communication systems that we set up also support the you know, acquisition of data, the synthesis of data, and the conversations that we know we're going to have to have on Earth that will affect what happens in these different planetary systems. So we actually had to think about this when we designed the simulated um, uh, workspace for the basalt mission as well as through subsea and we did so for the research purpose of understanding how what the volume of data was going to be per each EVA simulated EVA that we conducted and um, where most of that data volume would come from but interestingly enough um, you know it basically was to get our job done and of course when the communications enabled our, our work to happen nobody complained but of course when it went down then the folks that were running these experiments always heard from us. That's a kind of unfortunate uh, circumstance of being in that role. But a very wonderful and interesting spin-off happened in 2018 that I wanted to share with you all. Again, taking this back to what I imagine will be um, a sort of uh, a, a tactical operating environment that I can imagine that as we move into this more dynamic period of climate change, where it is affecting our human populations very directly, that hopefully more and more of you will be brought in to bear on with your expertise to help manage. So in 2018, Kilauea, uh, the Kilauea eruption event occurred. We had just as a team, the basalt team, been working on the flanks of Kilauea. You know, this article came out in the New York Times about our work. And then when you know it, this event happened. And so we were actually um, called in by the USGS because they knew that we had created these communication um, networks that were responsive to supporting science, to supporting tactical decision-making in the remote environments that we were working in around Kilauea. You see some of the images here of the devastation of the incredible power of this event, and it affected many people's lives directly on the island. And so we were brought in because we had this knowledge and they wanted to find out if we could actually spin off this knowledge to assist them with their emergency operations. And in this circumstance, what was lacking in their emergency operations they, that they wanted our assistance with is the ability to stream real time from a variety of their aerial assets. Some of the um, video that was being captured um, because it, from these different um, flow points, from the eruption points, and also from the, er, from the more populated centers, because this was helping them gain greater situational awareness in real time about the eruption. Um, and so we actually, um, and you know, through the, the knowledge of operating in the Kilauea region for the purposes of the simulated um, experiments that we were conducting, actually had a spin-off um, live stream application that we implemented within the Emergency Operations Center. And this enabled, as I mentioned, greater situational awareness for the emergency crews by providing them live stream video data from these different aerial assets during the eruption event. So what you see here is a video in the top um, <clears throat> of video coming in from um, a, hel a helicopter overflight, again, that was enabled through this spin-off of technology to support this tactical um, decision-making uh, requirement. And what was pretty neat to us is that this architecture that was then implemented um, uh, for the EOC, for the Emer um, Emergency Operations Center, was used to help um, them actually evacuate an individual um, as they, as you see here, the flow coming in behind them. And this was something that was happening at night and they actually had eyes on the situation so that they could um, talk this person out and help this person um, evacuate from this very dangerous area. So, you know, we did not anticipate that this spin-off would, spin would happen, but again, there was a common thread of having to make tactically 
um, important decisions in a very you know, timely manner and to be able to aggregate a lot of different information all at once. Um, and those types of threads, as I mentioned, has, have just you know, really um, come to the forefront as we've, as we've been investigating all of these different analog environments. So typically, when we think about ocean worlds and the conversation, which is very topical right now, which is to actually bring together the world of ocean exploration and ocean worlds to learn from each other, we tend to, to gravitate towards the comparisons um, between you know, the natural sciences components of these two um, particular fields. But you know, I would like to say yes and. Let's consider some of the operational, some of the technological, tech, technological um, learnings that we've garnered by working together in other analog environments, in this particular analog environment of, of the ocean worlds and, and the um, ocean sciences, and then think about how we might actually use these learnings to help us in the future manage our, our world's oceans, you know, mitigate and manage through the, the coming dynamic period of change. Um, so I'll leave you with these highlights to consider that, um, again, the operational concepts of capabilities that have been found to be enabling for analog and space exploration missions are indeed extensible to Earth exploration, to Earth missions under dynamic and tactically demanding work conditions. And science as a truly interdisciplinary element um, you know, requires us to have rapid decision making and we can impact rapid decision making if we design work practices and supporting capabilities that enable our communities to galvanize our intellectual resources for the deployment on a moment's notice. So thank you very much. I will stop there and take questions. Thank you so much, Darlene. That was fantastic.